order, a war for gold, a war for money, and a war for souls, a war on terror, a war on drugs, a war on kindness, a war on hugs, a war on birds, and a war on bees, they got a war on hippies trying to save the trees. Hi, I'm Liz Reese, and welcome to Voices of Resistance. We're filming the intro for today's program down at Ward Warehouse. And for today's program, I'm gonna show you a teach-in put out from Refuse Fascism. But before you see that, it's important to show you what's happening down at Ward War Warehouse with the free speech exhibit. Now, a little background and history about Ward Warehouse. You know, um, Ward Warehouse was built about 40 years ago. I believe in 1976 it was first built. And along with colonization and capitalization, you see redevelopment, you see accumulation of land, resources, people, and even their culture. You know, when you look historically at Ala Moana Shopping Center, that was built back in the late 50s. And at the time that was built, it was actually the biggest and largest shopping mall in the whole United States and was bragged about that. And you know, for local people, we've come to enjoy hanging out at Ala Moana, coming down to Ward Warehouse. You know, if you have the means and the money to shop at the stores and buy the goods and eat at the restaurants, it's a cool place to hang out. I mean, who doesn't have wonderful memories of family and friend functions down at the Spaghetti Factory, for example? Um, but one thing you have to be clear about, these things were always set up for people who could afford them. And as long as you had the means, you were welcome to use these facilities. And for many people, it was reasonable to take your family out to the shops or buy things. And now here we are at a time when you see everything happening at even a higher level. Look at Ala Moana, who's welcome there now? It's all luxury shops, keeping people out. Certainly homeless people or poor people have never been welcome there and will never be welcome there. And the reason we're down at Ward Warehouse because it's about to be torn down at the end of July and in August. They're tearing down Ward Warehouse, doing away with all these shops, all these businesses. Some of the businesses will be relocated, but many of the smaller shops will not be able to, or afford to go to other places. Um, so, one of the ironic things happening about Ward Warehouse before this huge luxury high rise by the Howard Hughes Corporation is built up to exclude even more people to make it very clear that it's for a very certain, you know, upper class type of people who are in these areas. And homeless people will be even more shut out of areas where they're already excluded. But one of the very cool things happening right now down at a location where there is no longer a shop is a free speech exhibit. Now, you have to also look at the irony of this. The irony is not lost on me that people are able to set up a free speech exhibit in between redevelopments. But here we are having a space for two weeks, which is a really cool and wonderful thing and should be supported and recognized. This was set up by Hawaii J20 and the Art Shenanigans Group, which has been doing wonderful art things and really you know, taking it out to marches and protests and events. So we're gonna go inside to the free speech exhibit and check it out and find out what's happening. Come on in. So this is one of the spaces that was formerly a shop and now it's empty. And it's too bad that these kind of spaces can't be used all the time for these kinds of things, for all kinds of people, for resistance, for free speech, for talking about the real issues that are happening, where homeless people would actually be welcome and told, come on in, we even have a bathroom you can use. So we're going to talk to some of the folks from Hawaii J20 over here and find out what's happening. And here it says, welcome to free speech. Freedom of speech and funding for the arts are under attack. Hawaii J20 invites you to exercise your First Amendment rights loudly and creatively. 
Hawaii J20 is a nonpartisan, community-based political organization formed out of the necessity to protest Donald Trump and Trumpism. The objects and wearable art on view have been produced by Hawaii J20 for performances, marches, and other political actions conducted around Honolulu since January 20th, Inauguration Day. Resistance can take many forms. Get mad, get weird, get making before it's too late. So you gotta love the spirit just when you walk in this place of what's happening and all this really cool, recycled, makeable art that's here on display. So if you don't mind, I'm just gonna have each of you introduce yourself really quickly, even though some of them didn't know I was gonna do this to them. Hi, I'm Colleen Rostbanek. And Colleen's very cool working with Hawaii J20 and does a lot of work. Would you mind introducing yourself? Hi, I'm Giovanna Sullivan. Right on. And here we go. Jan Dickey. Jan, if you could just tell us a little bit about what's happening over here and what did you folks, you know, want to accomplish with having this space here for two weeks? Well, um, since uh, Inauguration Day and even before that, after the election, um, a lot of, I was um, uh, just recently graduated from UH Manoa and was surrounded by a lot of artists that were pretty pissed off about um, the this, this sort of ideology that had taken over uh, the executive branch um, of government and we're looking for a way to sort of channel that frustration and see if we could uh, use our skills and what we like to do um, to um, to do something you know that felt meaningful in some sort of way so uh, it sort of began uh, really in this uh, chaotic, unsystematic way of just um, people meeting up and um, there was a series of stitch-ins uh, held on campus where um, we started sewing um, these these American flag straight jackets over on the wall behind us uh, were one of the first things that came came about through um, through the stitch-ins. There was also um, some aprons made that were modeled after the um, the suffragette um, aprons from the suffragette movement, and um, we partnered with um, um, Arm and Roller Press um, to do a bunch of screen printing, and that's become a big part of uh, what Art and Shenanigans and Hawaii G20 is about: is getting donated uh, T-shirts and making our own materials from other donated fabrics, uh, screen printing slogans, and um, and things like that onto, onto them and just distribute them, them uh, for free to, you know, build solidarity and build a, an atmosphere of resistance um, around Honolulu. Uh, but then it, things sort of like kept developing. We made like giant puppets. Uh, we've done other like uh, weird performances as ways of attracting attention to some of the marches that YG20 put on and we have made lots of uh, n drums and noisemakers out of trash. So you'll see in the, in the back of the gallery there's shopping carts and plastic buckets that have been turned into into drums. Um, so, I mean, basically what we're, what we're trying to do is, uh, with this exhibit, is just demonstrate to people that there's um, there's other ways of, 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 of protesting that don't necessarily have to be um, verbal. Um, that you can you can protest with a uh, with a beat you know you can protest um, by sitting here and, and and sewing fabric together or you know using uh, using paint or or paper mache to to make an object or using your body um, in a performance because um, that's what me and a lot of my you know artist friends um, know how to do or are interested in doing and um, and this shows a, sort of a record um, of, of what we've done so far and an invitation for other people to, um, per, to participate with us or on their own and, and start you know, acting um, creatively about the, um, the, the madness that's, that's, that's going on right now um, with, our, with our government. So uh, people are free to interact with the drums. They can you know, beat on the drums for a while. We've got uh, co uh, the costumes on racks so people can try them on and play around. Um, there's a painting you can put your head inside uh, to, to put yourself in the position of uh, dumping Trump. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the opening on this Saturday from 5 to 9 um, here at Ward Warehouse is going to kind of highlight all those pr participatory elements. We'll have a drummer come in and he's going to help like people do some group drumming and keep a beat. Um, and then we're going to have sort of an absurdist catwalk uh, with the, the costumes and we're going to, art, art and Shenanigans, which is the component of J20 I'm a part of, is going to meet up and put the script together for that this week. And we'll have um, some projections to happening um, 
from the in Instagram hashtag 808 what's your sign. Um, so if you've got any protest signs on your Instagram account and want to edit it and add that, that hashtag, then they'll be incorporated into what we're projecting here just as a way of kind of collecting um, all the, the creative, you know, paintings and signs that have been made by people in the community um, and, and bringing that into, in, into part of this and showing just how people have independently and collectively uh, channel their creativity into um, whatever it's a piece of cardboard with paint on it or you know whatever people have done cool thank you Jan um, as an activist myself I can tell you that working with Hawaii J20 um, the art shenanigans has been so inspiring to me and when you're at events or you know talking to people just having this real culture of resistance and the art that they come up with and produce out of what's, you know, really just a bunch of crap and rubbish and turning it into some really cool kick-ass stuff used for fighting against, you know, the Trump regime and the Trump agenda is really inspiring and really wonderful to me. And it's really cool to walk into an exhibit where it's like, don't touch this, don't touch the wall, that you're actually encouraged to like get in here and check everything out and feel it and be a part of it and get involved with it and to like turn that around and you know take it to more levels yourself so let's check out some of the really cool stuff happening at the welcome to free speech now i actually love these american straight jackets i've got you know mixed reviews from people i talk to but i just think it is you know so cool and represents to me America strapping you down and making you literally insane because what's happening is crazy. And the US really is putting a straitjacket on people. And we gotta like get out of these bounds and fight against it. So I think this in itself is just like a really wonderful statement. And they even have ones that people can put on and try it on, what it feels like to be completely nuts, locked, locked up in a loony bin, wearing an American straitjacket. So let's go check out some more stuff. This is one of the monsters that was used at the tax march, um, which was on April 15th that Hawaii J20 organized for Donald Trump, show us your taxes. And there was a lot of different, you know, guerrilla theater happening. There was people dressed up in different costumes. And this was this like, you know, nuts, money, capitalist monster coming down the street. And then they have just a small selection of some of the really cool signs that at the different protests, I can tell you there have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of signs, uh, most of which we no longer have. But, you know, since Trump was inaugurated, I can say as an activist for, you know, 25, 30 years under Trump, I've seen some of the most creative and really out there signs happening. So we're encouraged to walk around. These are some of the sound carts that were used at the marches, especially on January 20th, the inauguration resistance march that happened here. So these are just shopping carts rounded up with pots and pans, and you can roll them down the street. And as you're marching and protesting, hey, hey, ho, ho. Trump and Pence have got to go. So these are, you know, really cool, which anyone can make and anyone can do. And it's a really cool way to make a loud, powerful statement. They also have a lot of these recycled drums that, you know, you just wear around you and bang it with whatever you want and make some noise. Because now is definitely the time where we need to make some noise and we need to have our voices heard. And these are pretty cool. These are all recycled tins that, you know, almost look like cool little purses or bags you can just wear around you. They say, stop the madness. So all you need is something to pound it with and make some noise. And you got a walking purse going drum. Because you never know when you might need to make some noise. And over here we have some of the mannequins wearing different things. Some of the different silk screens that Hawaii J20 has been doing. I myself am wearing one of the cool shirts, stand up. 
make noise. And something really cool um, about the art shenanigans is, you know, they really make a point of doing everything recycled, even all the shirts that were silk screened. You know, they didn't go out and buy any shirts. All they did was ask people to donate shirts and they were able to get huge numbers of shirts from people. And you know, it's all about not making any more crap and using what we got. Kushner, Bannon, they gotta go too, cause the whole cabinet gotta go. And here's another banner that was used um, at an event, a uh, festival of resistance at the University of Hawaii, which was made um, by Hawaii J20 and some of the artists, uh, local artist Eric Beyer drew it and it's really cool. I'll come behind here so you can see my face. So it's very interactive as you can see. So like I said, this exhibit is going to be set up, um, unfortunately, for just a couple weeks in between the knocking and tearing down of Ward Warehouse until the new luxury high rise comes up from the Howard Hughes Corporation. Um, but you know, for a couple weeks, we're allowed to have a space where free speech is welcome and free speech is warranted. So you know, we got to make the best of it. We should see these kinds of things everywhere, all over the world, not just on construction sites, not just on buildings that are about to be torn down. So we're here at the old spaghetti factory at Ward Warehouse, which we need to say goodbye to, which will be torn down very shortly. There's usually a wait to get in. They always have fairly good business. But under capitalism, you know, it's just not making quite enough money because there's more, more, more money to be made. There's more resources to be accumulated. There's more developments to go up. So here we are saying aloha to the old spaghetti factory, making way for bigger and better capitalism. Light lamps, you can get everything because everything is for sale. So let me tell you folks a little bit about the teach-in that you're going to be watching um, for the rest of today's program. Now this is actually a teach-in that was filmed in April, April 27th of this year, 2017. So it was a Refuse Fascism teach-in in New York City on April 27th at the Church of the Village. The title of the teach-in is Fascism in America. Can it happen here? Is it happening here? What is the danger the Trump-Pence government poses? Now, this was done a couple months ago, um, but it's still very important. It's a very important message. But it's also important to recognize that in that short period, the two months since this was filmed, stuff has actually gotten a hell of a lot worse. But there's some really wonderful speakers, and I think it's important for people to hear it. The parts I'm going to show you are just the introduction speakers. There are actually four main speakers, and you're going to be seeing one of them. His name is George Prochnik, and he's an author and New Yorker contributor. And, you know, I've talked about fascism a lot on Voices of Resistance and how the Trump Pence regime is really moving towards fascism. Trump is a fascist, make no mistake about it, and their agenda is that of fascism. And you know, some people, you know, have agreement, but I think a lot of people just really aren't recognizing the real danger of how this is actually a fascist agenda. So the reason I picked one of the speakers to show you, George Prochnik, you know, he's a very smart 
academic intellectual. And he goes back in history and really breaks it down of you know, what's happening now with Trump and Pence and why this is a fascist agenda. And he uses historical evidence. Um, and he'll talk about um, Stefan Zweig, who's a Austrian Jew and an author. And you know, I think it's really important that people look at both history and look at Hitler, how Hitler came to power, and look at now. And while there are many differences, people really have to wake up and recognize why this is a fascist agenda, why regardless of all our differences, anyone, anyone out there who cares about humanity, who cares about you know, the politics of cruelty and sees how we have a government that is attacking people time and time after again from immigrants to Muslims, to blacks, to Latinos, to the poor, to women, to the whole planet itself. So anyone out there who cares about humanity, who cares about the planet, needs to come together and unite to fight against this fascist agenda, to stand up and oppose Trump and Pence. So I hope you enjoy the teaching that you're gonna see. There were four main speakers. You're just gonna see one of the speakers. So I encourage people to go to refusefascism.org. You can watch it in its entirety, but I hope you enjoy it. And thank you for watching Voices of Resistance and welcome to free speech. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to see uh, some new faces here and some, some old friends from Refuse Fascism. Uh, my name is J.W. Walker. I am a member of the steering committee for the New York chapter of Refuse Fascism. And I'd like to welcome you all here today to the United Methodist Church of the Village who've so kindly uh, given us this space this evening. Uh, we're here today to um, discuss a few very, very important questions uh, given the nature of uh, what's going on in our country and in the world. Fascism in America, could it happen here? Is it happening here? What is the danger that the Trump-Pence government poses? Uh, we have uh, arranged to have a wonderful panel of some very interesting thinkers and thought leaders uh, that will be discussing the various aspects of the Trump-Pence regime and how it relates to uh, the history of this country, the history of the world, and uh, the rise of fascism uh, in this country and uh, historically uh, around the globe. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our moderator for this evening. Uh, Sansara Taylor is a writer for Revolution newspaper, rev.revcom.us, and has been, among other things, on the front lines of the fight for women's rights to abortion, and all-around liberation for many years. She's also a co-initiator of RefuseFascism.org, and she'll be our moderator for tonight. Sansara. There we go. Good evening, and I want to thank Jay for the welcome, and I want to echo him in welcoming you here tonight, everybody in the church, everybody tuning in live on Facebook or online to tonight's teaching. Fascism in America. Could it happen here? Is it happening here? What is the danger the Trump-Pence government poses? As we approach the end of the first 100 days of the Trump-Pence government, some are calling it a failure. Some are finding assurance or reassurance in how little they claim he has accomplished. In reality, what is most striking is how much he has accomplished. A global gag order that will take the lives of thousands of women and put abortion beyond reach for millions more around the world. A witch hunt against scientists who worked on climate change and the acceleration of fossil fuel extraction that is destroying our planet. A new Supreme Court justice, 
or that's what they call him, who has defended torture, police brutality, and vicious religious bigotry, a proven racist as the head of the Justice Department, a Christian fundamentalist in charge of public schools, not just one, but two Muslim bans where even after they were stopped by the courts, Trump found a way to impose them anyhow through diplomatic cables, a ramped up deportation force that has abducted a father in front of his daughter on the way to school, that snatched a cancer tumor patient out of the hospital and that has deported the first DACA recipient and instilled terror into thousands, no millions of others throughout this country. And then there's his bellicose threats of war and military aggression, 59 Tomahawk missiles on Syria, the largest non-nuclear bomb in the world dropped on Afghanistan. And now he plays nuclear chicken with North Korea, literally playing with the lives of millions of people on this planet. To the degree that people see this as a failure to accomplish anything, to the degree that the media says he's finally becoming normal or more presidential, this is the degree to which the previously unthinkable has become normalized already, with even greater stakes for humanity if it is not stopped. This is why it is so important that we have gathered here together tonight. The world is changing rapidly, and it's important for us to take stock, to get an accurate picture of what we are facing, because you cannot stop something you do not understand. In the 1960s, when a generation stood up and helped stop a brutal war in Vietnam, teach-ins were an essential part of that struggle arming students and others with a deep understanding of the nature of the war they were confronting and the horrors it was causing. When the AIDS epidemic first emerged, a cohort of people, most of whom had no medical ex expertise at all, studied and became experts so that along with their courageous and disruptive activism, they had the knowledge they needed to fuel their fight to stop a plague. Today, Fighting for this kind of knowledge is even more critical. A central part of the Trump-Pence government's program is an all-out assault on critical thinking, on the ability to discover what's true and to hold others to account for it. And so we must be even more determined tonight and going forward to fill ourselves with critical thinking and evidence, to foster deep thinking and understanding about the real world, and to confront fully and as deeply as possible the nature and the character of the danger we are facing in order to fuel our struggle and our fight in the name of humanity to stop the Trump-Pence regime. The questions we'll be getting into tonight are critical about fascism in America, and the speakers we have gathered will shed light on these questions from different political perspectives and with different areas of expertise, and so it'll be a rich exchange. We will all be provoked, we will all learn new things, we will all be challenged, and we will all emerge with greater intellectual and moral tools and a heightened responsibility and ability to act on what we know. So I want to thank them and I want to thank all of you around the country tuning in and here in the church for spending your evening together with us doing this. I want to thank the United Methodist Church of the Village for opening this space to us. I want to thank all the volunteers who worked tirelessly to put this together. And I want to thank our partners for this evening. Revolution Books Educational Fund, they have a table in the back and the WBAI radio station of the Pacifica Network, who is our media sponsor tonight. So our first speaker I'm very happy to introduce is a writer whose articles, poetry, and fiction have appeared in the New York Times, in Book Forum, in the Los Angeles Review of Books and other journals. He's the editor-at-large for Cabinet Magazine, and his latest book is Stefan Zweig, At the End of the World. He recently wrote an article for The New Yorker entitled, When It's Too Late to Stop Fascism. I'd like to ask you to join me in giving a warm welcome to George Prochnik.
How's this for volume? Is that okay? Um, thank, thanks so much for having me to this event. Um, I'm going to try to give a little historical lens on the threat that we face. And to begin that, I want to read something not by Stefan Zweig, but from Primo Levi, who was an Italian chemist and eventually a survivor of Auschwitz. He wrote a very, uh, one of the greatest memoirs that exists about that experience. And he wrote the following. We must be listened to above and beyond our personal experiences. We have collectively witnessed a fundamental, unexpected event. Fundamental precisely because unexpected, not foreseen by anyone. It took place in the teeth of all forecasts. It happened that an entire civilized people followed a buffoon whose figure today inspires laughter. And yet Adolf Hitler was obeyed and his praises were sung right up to the catastrophe. It happened, therefore it can happen again. That is the core of what I have to tell you. I want to come back at some point. I hope someone will ask a question about that idea of the buffoon, because I actually think that's very important in terms of how Trump, is, Trump has been perceived, and to an extent how he's been normalized. But Stefan Zweig, um, the man that I wrote about, was a person of enormous affluence and influence, an Austrian Jew who was born uh, at the end of the 19th century and by the late 1920s was the most widely translated author in the world. A huge bestseller. His films were made into movies. He wrote novels, essays, poetry, libretti, plays. He also grew up in a very wealthy family in Vienna's most privileged district, the first district on the Ringstrasse. This was a person who felt himself absolutely immune to histories, to political turbulence. And within a very short period of time, within, in fact, less than 10 years from the point at which he was the most widely translated author in the world, Stefan Zweig's books were being burned, and he himself was on the run from not just Hitler, but the overall resurgence of an intense militant nationalism that came about with the ascendancy of fascism. To give just a little background on his exile, because it's germane to the book that he wrote, the memoir that he wrote, that I want to focus on and what I have to say. In 1934, in the winter of 1934, there was a brief civil war in Austria. It's an event that not many people who don't study the period know much about. It took place over just a period of a few weeks, but it effectively gutted the Austrian, the very powerful and very effective Austrian Socialist Party. It was essentially a, a battle between the socialists and various reactionary forces allied with the then clerico-fascist leader of, of Austria, someone named Dolphus, who wasn't himself at that point aligned with Hitler, who was in fact trying to keep um, Austria from being annexed by Germany, but had his own homegrown version of fascism and felt sufficient pressure from the more reactionary elements in his party to, that, that, he, that he felt he could no longer allow socialism to exist as a viable movement in, in Austria. And once he managed to essentially destroy the party by either arresting people or driving them into various forms of exile and killing many hundreds, the road was open for, um, for Hitler, Hitler's annexation of the country in 1938. Stefan Zweig, when that civil war took place, was based in Salzburg, which is just over the border from Germany. He himself had been working for years at that point to promote humanism. He was one of the best-known pacifists in the world. He had a home 
on a hill, in fact, overlooking Salzburg, a very exposed position. Nonetheless, at one point as the war was winding down, his home was searched by the local police for guns. They, there was a suspicion that he might be hiding arms for, to be distributed to the socialists. And he knew at that point that if one of the best known pacifists in the world could be accused of harboring uh, secret weapons cache at the same time that he also was in an incredibly exposed position, that he himself was going to be endangered in no short order. And the very next day, he got on a train and headed to England, which was the first stop in an exile that careened all over the world eventually. He was, he was in, first in London, then in Bath, England, then in New York, then in Ossinic, New York, then in Rio de Janeiro, and then at last in Petropolis, Brazil, just above Rio, about an hour above Rio in the hills, where he killed himself in February of 1942. But the summer before he killed himself, he was just up the Hudson from where those of us in New York City are today, not very far at all. He lived, in fact, about a mile uphill from Sing Sing Prison. And I've often thought what it would have been like for him going back and forth on the train from New York City and having the sight of that massive fortress as a reminder of what was happening to his, his people and to all of Europe at that point in time. While he was in Austria, excuse me, in Ossinic, in that summer of 1942, he wrote at a furious pace the first draft of his autobiography, The World of Yesterday. But it's not a typical memoir. It has almost no intimate personal details of his life. Instead, what he was trying to do was to create a kind of message in the bottle to the future, to give indications about what aspects of civilization needed to be watched because they could pivot into something, some kind of heinous form of totalitarianism, and also to give some, some index, index of what might be points of hope, what, what were aspects of the evolution of Europe that he'd lived through, which if they'd been cultivated might have prevented Hitler's rise. He managed to write literally something like 300 pages in a matter of less than a month. He was writing in this feverish pace. He never left this very, very small, very grim bungalow that he lived in. And it's amazing to think of this man who'd been at the center of all sorts of different European movements aimed at promoting humanism. Redu it reduced to this very, very contracted existence, almost no social life in this tiny little house in this town that for him was in the middle of nowhere. But I think it gave him a certain fiery clarity, gave his remarks a real passion that it merits revisiting today because he tried to trace what he had missed. It's a very, it's a very modest book in many ways. One of, the, one of the points that he makes right away is that he can't remember when he first heard Hitler's name. He doesn't know where that, the whole movement associated with Hitler and even preceding Hitler in terms of Italian fascism, where it began to be a real issue. One of the points Zweig makes is that in these periods where there is a, an, an intense upsurge of nationalist reactionary elements, there are going to be many little figures any one of whom might be the one who, from some bizarre confluence of circumstances, ends up being the dictator to watch. And I've thought about this for a number of reasons in terms of what we're seeing today, partly because horrific as this administration is, we don't know that Trump is the person who is going to really take things all the way over the edge. And I think it behooves all of us to be very vigilant about other figures who may seem absolutely marginal today, but who are garnering some kind of support in some little corner and may ultimately have, if not a charisma, some magnetic message, some way to channel a very dark will amongst, amongst the masses. So what does Feig tell us to watch out for? One thing he says, and he, and he remarks on this long before Hitler, again, was the chancellor of Germany, but when fascism was gaining power, he, he writes of seeing the little groups of young conscripts 
to the National Socialist Movement, moving through town in these beautiful limousines, in very, very fancy cars, trucks, and spanking new uniforms, very, 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 very well decked out. In other words, they were well financed. And I think it's always good in, a, you know, in the old Marxist adage to follow the money. And so one thing with this administration, and it's more, more I don't know what the right word is, more virulently activist elements, is to look at what is being funded. He says the second thing to watch out for, and maybe the most important aspect of what we witnessed in this last election, is the power of propaganda, right? And, and it's not just propaganda to spread a lie, to ins ignite a frenzy among the core followers. It's also propaganda that can serve to distract and cover up the actions, where, that, the actions that the administration, that the party is focused on really managing to bring through to fruition. I thought a lot about this issue of distraction in this last campaign, even apart from the message of hate. I think if the planet survives another hundred years, survives this man and his, and his like-minded cohort, I suspect that people will look back on the 2016 election as a real watershed in the distraction of the electorate, partly technologically induced ADD. I mean, there, there can't have been any campaign before where there could be one outrage after another, which would just seem to evaporate within days, partly because the mainstream media didn't continue covering it, but also because people seemed unable to hold in their heads the jumble of the sheer volume of outrages, but also the sheer volume and barrage of different kinds of information that were being fed through them, through this feed that we seem all too addicted to. There, there, there was a remark that really rang through my head from Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, who noted that when the Constitution was being framed in Independence Hall, the authors of that document had the road in front of, of Independence Hall covered with straw so that the sound of the coach wheels would be muffled and wouldn't disturb their, their debates, their discussions. And if, I, if we think about that level of attention and the absolute diffraction of our minds today, I think we all have to do everything we can to spend time off all devices and really trying to think as hard as we can to just think about what's going on in the most, in the most concentrated way possible. Um, along with propaganda, the money, and the charismatic leader that in some sense we have to acknowledge Trump is, Zweig makes the point that the Nazi party was able to introduce its measures as effectively as it did because it took the approach of giving one poison pill at a time. It didn't try, the party didn't try, in other words, to throw everything on at once and just disorient people. There was an effort to see how each new measure would take and when the European body politic gave sufficient resistance to a measure, they'd back off and wait, and then give another pill. It was one pill at a time until Zweig writes, people were so inured to the effects of the poison that they were willing essentially to embrace the, the, the apocalypse. Finally, on this issue of Trump's character and, and the idea which I think resonates very profoundly with what we've seen of the buffoon, I can't tell you how many writers, activists, thinkers of the 1930s wrote about their experience of Hitler initially having been an experience of such a fool that they could not believe that this man should be taken seriously. Um, the son of Thomas Mann, Klaus Mann, who was himself an important writer and progressive thinker, described an experience where he was sitting in a, in a Bavarian tea house at one point, and he realized Hitler was at another table with a few of his henchmen. And he was there 
consuming these little cakes in this unbelievably boorish manner, stuffing his face. And Man says that he looked at this man, at this petite bourgeoisie figure, this embodiment of just a kind of vile piggishness, and said, there's nothing to worry about. He can't possibly cause us a problem. Zweig writes about how when Hitler's writings were, began to be circulated, the, how the, his sheer inarticulateness, his inability to make an effective argument, to, to say anything with force, made the intellectuals just dismiss him in exactly the same way. I worry that all of the ways that Trump has shown himself willing to play the fool, to, to be a clown, to show, to display his intellectual mediocrity, has allowed sometimes for a, a kind of snarkiness to overtake a real analysis of what he's doing, of all of the little measures on top of the big threats that he makes. I think it's been, what, however intentionally or not, it doesn't matter, it's been an incredibly effective smokescreen. Everyone has so much to mock that the fact that he does exactly what he says he does, that he has to be taken both seriously and literally, gets lost. In Zweig's memoir, he goes through a whole slew of different stages that darkened the canvas in Europe. And he says, finally, that one thing was still missing. This is after Hitler's ascendancy. He said, even when Hitler became chancellor, people still, and he counts himself among the people, had no notion, no notion whatsoever of what was coming. Not a clue. For all that they were aware that they had put in, that Germany had put in power an incredibly dangerous, unpredictable person with incredibly vicious rhetoric, there was not a hint of what was to come. So, what was the moment for Zweig that really tipped events into some irretrievable, disastrous abyss? That was uh, the Reichstag fire, the burning of the German parliament building that happened less than 30 days after Hitler became chancellor. This was a fire that there's been speculation may have even been ignited by Nazis, the Nazis themselves. No lives were lost. It was the destruction of a symbolic edifice. But it became the excuse for Hitler to suspend all pretense of due legal process. Everything from that point on became an emergency measure. Of course, it seems to me that we already see signs of Trump looking for that act of terror, either false or actual, exaggerated or not, that gives him the excuse to suspend any kind of judicial responsibility. I worry profoundly about that. And it's one of the reasons that I think so far from ever allowing this administration to be normalized, it has to be resisted every single step in every single executive order has to be protested. There, the minute that an agenda that we know has such an enormous tide of hatred behind it is in any way allowed to become business as usual, I think that the opportunity for bursting out with some massive atrocity that changes the, the ball game overnight is huge. You know, people are still making a lot of money in this administration, while this administration's in power. That's one of the reasons that the GOP has shown itself so spineless. Until the economics are disrupted, I think it's going to be very, very hard to really get at him. But if people boycott, goods, if they block roads, if, if, if the people who make Trump possible start feeling this is not working out so well economically, maybe we can avoid that 
that catastrophic last moment. You know, Zweig teaches us that there is, in fact, a, a window in which it's possible to act. But once that comes down, you're in a whole other reality, and there's no way out. And I hope that all of us do everything in our power to seize this hour now. We do still have the power to act. Things aren't yet set in stone. And it's all of our responsibility to do everything we can to fight. Thank you. Welcome, Eva. Thank you. Before two months ago, I had never been politically active. During the election, I was in college, about to graduate, and I was hoping to start a career in museum education, which I would later find out is nearly impossible without the National Endowment for the Arts, which Trump plans to cut entirely. Throughout the fall, I was disgusted, shocked, and alarmed by Trump's illegitimate rise to power. But I felt like there was nothing I could do. I traveled to DC for Inauguration Day protests and the Women's March, and it was my first protest ever. I met Refuse Fascism, and I was very moved that there was an organization out there fighting for the rights of all people who were under attack by the trump pence regime. And as I read the call to action, I began to realize that we are confronting fascism here and that the dangers are too severe to overlook. I suddenly knew that if I didn't do something to stop this, I would always regret it. So when I heard about the Refuse Fascism National Tour to drive out the Trump-Pence regime, I made a very spontaneous decision to quit my job and join the tour. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> We traveled for a full month, venturing out from New York um, and driving our van all the way to El Paso, Texas. We hosted organizing meetings, participated in informal gatherings and discussions, led rallies and marches, spent time on several university campuses, and made a powerful impact at the South by Southwest Music Festival in Austin. I had never really been to the South before, so I was expecting an overwhelming amount of Trump supporters in all of these so-called red states, um, but this was not the case at all. Everywhere we went, we encountered a broad sentiment against Trump and Pence. At the same time, there is a process of normalization and accommodation happening, and this is something we really have to work to challenge. But the millions we need are out there, even in the red states, who hate this regime and don't want to live in a Trump world. We are calling on you to join us. It is time for us to unite and act together now before it's too late. We need to be the leaders of the thousands to go on and lead the millions in mass resistance to stop this fascist regime to drive it from power. So, who is Refuse Fascism? Our single unifying mission is to drive out the Trump-Pence regime. We're an organization for anyone who hates what this administration is doing. Whether you're a Democrat, a Republican, an independent, um, a socialist, an anarchist, a communist, or totally unsure, if you're against the hatred embodied in this fascist regime, you need to join us. We manifest the power of no everywhere. No in the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. We mobilize to meet every outrage committed by this regime with greater and greater resistance. Um, and this is something that Andy just drew from, from our call to action, but I'm going to say it again because it's really important. Um, we are getting organized, working with all our creativity and determination toward the time when millions of people can be moved to fill the streets of cities and towns, 
day after day and night after night, declaring this whole regime illegitimate, demanding and not stopping until the Trump-Pence regime is driven from power. So if you're concerned about what Trump and Pence are doing, if you see the dangers we're facing, and if you believe that we all have a responsibility to stop their vicious attacks before it's too late, become part of Refuse Fascism. I want to share two concrete ways you can make a major difference right now. Um, I haven't even told really anyone about this yet, um, but I was with some of the volunteers out at a subway station handing out flyers. And two little girls came up to me. They were sisters, 10 and 11 years old. They wanted to get a sticker. So after I explained that we were working against Trump to stop all the bad things he's doing, one of them said, oh, well that's good because after Donald Trump won the election, some of the people at my school started being really mean to me and I think it's because I'm black and Muslim. They call me the N-word and they kicked me and pushed me. I'm really scared. The hateful rhetoric and aggressive policies of the Trump-Pence regime have real consequences. They're hurting these young girls. They're hurting girls and women and so many others all around the world. Humanity and the planet are at stake right now. If this fascist regime is able to consolidate power, millions will not survive and life on Earth will be in grave danger. When little kids come up to you in the subway station and tell you that they're afraid to go to school, it's hard to find the right words to say. All I could tell them was that I promise to do everything I can to stop what Trump and his followers are doing because this shouldn't be happening to you. None of this should be happening to anyone. Order, a war for gold, a war for money, and a war for souls. A war on terror, a war on drugs, a war on kindness, a war on hugs. A war on birds and a war on bees. They got a war on hippies trying to save the trees. A war with jets and a war with missiles. A war with high-seated government officials. Wall Street war on high finance. A war on people who just love to dance. A war on music, a war on speech, a war on teachers and the things they teach. A war for the last 500 years. A war's just messing up the atmosphere.